Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to part two of our series on American innovation and the Bell Labs model in the 21st century. I'm Dan O'Sullivan, Vice Chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum in New York City. I'm also an NYU graduate and a proud Bell Labs alum. So tonight's event resonates with me on at least a couple of levels. Now, some of you may remember uh, part one of the series from our live event in New York back in 2018. Um, the interest from that event led us to consider turning this topic into a broader series on innovation, education, and collaboration in the 21st century. In particular, we'll be taking a look at what, what worked really well in the past and how today's companies and individuals can prosper by using the parts of these models that still have value and relevance today. So, before we begin, uh, a few words on the MIT Enterprise Forum and our New York City chapter in particular. We're a global organization affiliated with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge through MIT Technology Review. We have 10 chapters here in the United States and about the same um, in uh, various countries throughout the world. So uh, we're a nonprofit and uh, we basically derive our revenue from sponsorships, partnerships and events like this evening. So uh, if you'd like to become a member, um, it's a very nominal uh, annual fee and uh, the cost of tonight's event can go towards that membership. So uh, with that behind, uh, let's uh, move on. What I'd like to do is um, see if I can share my screen here. And I've prepared a few slides uh, that will give us an overview of um, Bell Labs, its history and so forth. Um, let me see, okay. All right, so um, can you all see my screen there? Yelena, can you see my screen okay? Full screen? Yes, Dan, we're good. Good, great. Okay, so um, incorporated in 1925, uh, Bell Labs can trace its history all the way back to 1883. It was originally formed to develop communications equipment for AT&T, and uh, it routinely engaged in a vast range of basic and applied research topics. Uh, developed thousands of scientific and engineering innovations over the years. Several of these uh, form the fundamental building blocks of modern telecom, mobile, computers, software, and so forth. Uh, below are just a few of the, the fundamental technologies that changed our world uh, and gave us basically uh, the technology we have today, or the building blocks of that at least. So Bell Lab scientists and researchers have been awarded several Nobel Prizes. And uh, here's a list of them in particular, um, I think the cosmic micro um, microwave background radiation and um, the, the first transistor, just, just to mention out a few, but obviously some, some significant accomplishments there. Uh, such was the, um, the value of the Bell Labs model that when the government uh, helped form Sandia National Labs, uh, it decided to use the Bell Labs model uh, originally for uh, its own innovation and for national security. Okay, so um, here's a short movie of uh, Homedale, New Jersey, the facility for Bell Labs, uh, as, it, as it appeared just a couple of years ago. And I uh, thought that might give you a flavor for uh, what it was like to work at Bell Labs.
Okay, let's see. And now uh, a fireside chat with our featured guest, Yelena Kovacevic, uh, Dean of the Tandon School of Engineering at New York University. So let me just um, close out of this. Hi, Yelena. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so um, for our uh, audience, uh, Yelena is Dean of the Tannen School of Engineering at New York University. She joined Bell Labs after receiving her PhD from Columbia University. She was also a professor at Carnegie Mellon and head of the department of ECE. She has co-authored a number of award-winning papers and is also co-author of the textbooks, Wavelets and Subband Coding and the Foundations of Signal Processing. She's a fellow of the IEEE and was editor in chief of the IEEE Transactions on Image Processing. Yelena received the IEEE Signal Processing Technical Achievement Award, the Dow Fellowship at CMU, Belgrade October Prize, and the EI Jury Award at Columbia University. Her research interests include applying data science to a number of domains such as biology, medicine, and smart infrastructure. And she's an authority on multi-resolution techniques such as wavelets and frames. So with that, um, again, welcome, Yelena. We're, uh, we're very uh, grateful to have you this evening. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, an informative and engaging conversation. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Great. So um, we have a number of questions prepared for Yelena on uh, topics we believe the audience at large will be interested in. Um, and uh, I'd like to try to cover as many of these as possible tonight, but I'd also like to give our audience a chance to participate. Um, so feel free to message us in the chat box as we go through the session. And uh, we'll get through as many of these as time permits. So with that, uh, on to the first question. So what do you see as the greatest value your time at Bell Labs provided to your career? Well, I mean, the important thing um, when I think back at my time at Bell Labs is that that was my first job. So. <laughs> I joined Bell Labs as a fresh PhD, um, super excited to have access to people doing all kinds of things. We were talking about Bell Labs and, and people walking down the corridor and juggling balls. Uh, it was incredibly exciting. And, and you know, coming to a place where there was the open door policy and the groups and the departments were not really delineated by anything physical, you could just go down the corridor and knock on somebody's door and, and go in and ask the question. And also this, this flat hierarchy of really innovation and, and science and engineering, uh, it was just incredibly exciting. So I think what it provided me is just pushed me to learn more than just be involved in my own area because it was so enmeshed. You know, when I was a PhD student at Columbia, there were, you know, what, I guess two floors where our department sat. And that's where I spent most of the time, you know, apart from, you know, hanging out with friends and, and so on. But at Bell Labs, it was all mixed. And especially when you would go to cafeteria and people would you know, sit at the table and there were different tables discussing different things from scientific things to languages to there was a French table and I forget what else. Just this sense of excitement about doing research and math and science 
was something that, you know, I, I don't know that it, it, it's hard to imagine this anywhere else. So I think this kind of um, stayed with me. So, you know, when I think of Bell Labs, I think of this openness in my head and kind of openness in considering different things. I don't know if that, that answers your question, but that's, that's what strikes me as important. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely relate. And I, I saw that too uh, when I worked there and it was that, yeah, that aspect of, of I think openness and excitement and, 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 and probably being uh, amongst like-minded individuals that felt the same as you, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, having a, a seminar once a week, uh, you know, and people and, uh, you know, I was in different groups at Bell Labs, but at some point I was in math center and there was a room where every afternoon, I think from three to four, uh, there would be kind of coffee and tea and, and, and fruit and cookies. And one of the people from the center would be uh, in charge for a week to buy all this stuff and, you know, prepare coffee and people would come and congregate around the, the board and just talk. And sometimes it was just, you know, mid afternoon break, uh, get something sweet. Sometimes, you know, you had a problem that you couldn't solve and, and you wanted to hear from other people. It's just, it was this sense of really, it wasn't work. It was going to a place where you got to play with other people, as you said, like-minded people who like to do the same thing you do. Exactly. Yeah, great, great. Okay, very good. And uh, so were there any aspects to working at Bell Labs that you think 21st century companies like the Googles and the Amazons and also, you know, the smaller startups, um, the Y Combinator companies and so forth, um, that uh, they ought to adopt? You know, it's, it's funny when you ask this question, my answers of, of what was exciting, you know, to the first question would same, were same for the second one, like open doors, walk down the corridor, flat hierarchy, pulsing excitement, autonomy to choose your work. But when you think about today's companies and if you go and physically see how they look like, that's exactly how they look like, right? right. And I think this is why um, perhaps technology is booming so much that people are finding these places so exciting to work and innovate. And I think companies have recognized, I, most of them rightly so, that there is something about how this environment feels and looks that really promotes innovation and, and creativity. I don't think that creative people respond very well to very rigid, you know, sort of physical and intellectual borders. So in some sense, I, I have a feeling, I mean, I haven't worked in a, if one would call Bell Labs company, I never thought of it as a company, but I've worked in academia ever since, uh, but I have visited a number of companies and they all look like that. I mean, they look like playgrounds, right? <laughs> So I can imagine why our students are so excited to go and, and do these things because there is kind of this merging of personal and professional that makes it feel that when you go to work, you're just kind of extended. It's an extended uh, you know, version of your, of your personal sort of, not personal life, but what you like to do as a person. And so, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and I, I think you said it earlier, it's where, where you've, you said you felt like you were uh, at play. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're at play with something that you're very passionate about, uh, as opposed to, you know, maybe old school thinking where, you know, that's your job and then you go home to play. Uh, you know, you go elsewhere to play. So I, I think, yeah, and I, I do see that in, in modern companies where, um, whether they've consciously adopted some of the Bell Labs uh, aspects you've mentioned or not, but they're certainly doing a lot of the same things. But you're right. It could be that this was a precursor, right? The right. Bell Labs was a precursor for that type of innovation and creativity, and it had such a long history of accomplishments that you couldn't really argue with the model. It clearly worked. Whether okay, now the question is 
whether it was sustainable financially, there was somebody who was funding Bell Labs. Now, I think the companies have to, to, to have some sort of a, a trade-off between, you know, the product or whatever it is that they're providing and this type of freedom in deciding what you work on and how you work on it and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, so so back uh, for for Bell Labs, it was of course AT and T and 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 the federal government through that, and you know the country and the world, you know through World War II and and uh, and so forth needed these technologies, and so you definitely needed the deep pockets. But uh, you can kind of see that today a, a little bit, I think, with like Google, where you know search pretty much pays for everything else. Search and online advertising, right? So yeah. there's no question, you need the, you need the cash to- afford. Yeah, you have to be pragmatic, but in the end, look, you need the cash, but also many of these companies, whether they be big, and especially if you look at startups and small companies, they're absolutely passionate about the products they, they produce, you know? Yeah. That's what they do, that's what excites them, right? And, uh, you know, many of them find the real, perfect kind of mix of what people want to do and how actually it should be done. Exactly, exactly. Very good. Um, so what are your thoughts on big science and fundamental research in today's shareholder, shareholder value driven tech world, you know, where companies are hyper aware that they're accountable to shareholders and there's quarterly reports and so on. What do you think of uh, big science and fundamental research and its, uh, its uh, opportunities to prosper, prosper in that environment? Look, I, I don't wanna fall into the trap of, you know, sort of big, big companies are bad for innovation because, you know, they're, they're, they're driven by the fact that they have to make a profit and, and are accountable to shareholders. Many of these big companies started like as little companies, right? There were startups that had a great idea that then became like Google, that became just, you know, a giant. But I think that you can't just look at one sector. You have to look at various parts of this whole puzzle and I think academia plays a part and tech sector plays a part and government plays a part right so something like Bell Labs in my opinion I always thought should be something that should be like a government funded lab and maybe you don't have to have as many people as they were at Bell Labs at the time but you can have some number of people who really let them loose. They're so creative and, and you know, I'm not saying me, I'm saying others smarter than me. Let them loose, let them go figure out, you know, uh, things to work on because they usually do find important things to work on. And you have to have, you have to have a balance between the things that you're doing today that have an impact on society, and that's very important, you know, our school in particular is very focused on this. Not that there is no, I'm, and I don't want to make a, a big distinction between scientific res fundamental research and applied research. I think it's a, it's kind of a fake distinction, right? Because you have lots of fundamental research that's very, very applied and vice versa, right? But I think it can be done in, in, in different parts of this puzzle. The question is, how do you make this puzzle to work together to advance the entire society forward? Because I don't think any one of these pieces can do this on its own. True. I don't know if true. that answers your question, but that's yeah. sort of... No, no, it, it does. I think it, it definitely sheds light on it. Um, and it kind of uh, leads into my next question, or it's my next question is related to that which is, um, do you see the technology community focusing too much on the development of applications and not enough on fundamental research? So, uh, you know, in other words, is there too much of a focus? And again, driven by, by maybe short-term profit, um, you know, to get the next um, iPhone app or the next uh, speech application or, or the next, um, GPS enabled feature out there, 
Uh, and, you know, is there too much of a focus on that? Uh, and I, I appreciate that that's definitely necessary. And that's, you know, that's where a lot of the short term, the money is at least, whether short term, long term. But is it at the, is it at the cost of not focusing enough on fundamental research? You know, I think there one would really have to ask oneself, what do we mean by one or the other? What do we mean by fundamental research and what do we mean by applied research? I'm just going to use myself as an example. Um, so I always thought that what I did, I have a degree in electrical engineering. I was always more towards sort of building mathematical models, so more towards applied math. Okay, a pure mathematician would definitely not say that that's fundamental research, but an electrical engineer might, right? Along the course of my career, I've done a, a bunch of different things. And when I was at CMU, I spent, you know, more than a decade working on biomedical imaging. And at times I would work with biologists and doctors and they would, you know, need help on something that for me wasn't super research interesting if you want so i would not consider it from my point of view fundamental research but i would think like okay it was important enough that i think it was worth me spending time or my phd students spending time trying to help them but inevitably what would happen is that the methods or techniques or math models or whatever else we were using would hit a wall somewhere because of some real world constraint so i who consider myself relatively theoretical, started to really appreciate what the real world and the sort of now would bring into my work, because then I would have to figure out ways to get around it. And then if I would figure, figure it out, I would try to kind of generalize it to make it applicable to potentially other areas. So I think it's a, it's a real interplay. I mean, fundamental research, unless you're doing research on you know, I don't know, on bosons or you're doing fundamental research in biology and you don't really know what the impact is in the five, the next five, 10 years, the rest of the things that we do are on, on some scale from fundamental to applied, you know, whatever that means, right? And, you know, you can think that it could be fundamental research to figure out the vaccine for COVID-19, but it's also very applied because we all need it and you know it's going to be released, you know, with you know clear application hopefully soon. Um, so I, I, I just stopped as much as I used to do this, I stopped making a really big distinction, but at the same time, it is understood that some of the things that people research today may not seem like they have an immediate application and perhaps 10 percent of this research in 10 or 20 years will be what's needed to push the next generation of whatever that may be you know wireless technology i think you know you either had or will have tom arzetta um, speak to you right right so what he did, you know, 10 or 15 years ago is now is was fundamental research, but now is going to be absolutely necessary to enable, well, it was necessary to enable 5G, might be necessary to enable 6G. So what they do today on 6G might be fundamental, but in 10 years from now will be very applied. I don't know if that makes any sense, but sort of. Yeah, no, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh... It's interesting you bring, um, you know, 5G and 6G as examples. I remember when I worked in Homedale back when they were developing cellular technology. And I remember at lunch talking to some of my uh, colleagues and, and, you know, it had been out a few years and they were testing it in Chicago where there was a guy driving around Chicago with like a massive unit in the trunk of his car <laughs> yeah. and wires streaming into the dashboard. And, uh, you know, even ourselves, engineers at the time, were kind of uh, saying, I don't see the applicability. Why would you want to talk and drive at the same time? And, you know, why do you want to be always reachable and that? And yet, look what it morphed into, you know? So, yeah. yeah. 
true. And you can, I mean, I remember when I was a PhD student, that's when neural networks kind of came around. And at the, at the time it looked like a fad that couldn't have a real application because it was not possible to process, you know, there was no computing power that would be able to do. And this thing of like being able to model human brain sounded like hair brain, right? But today, you know, look what people are doing with deep learning and everything else. So you never know, right? What, what will, that's not to say that everything we do today in 30 years will be super useful, but you have to explore. And sometimes you just have to go where if you have the luxury of doing it and in academia, uh, even though you have to look for funding, you sort of have the luxury of figuring out what you want to do and in which direction you want to push your research. True, true. And I, I, I like your, um, your point about they really, they're not mutually exclusive, the, yeah. the applications and the fundamental. In fact, they're complementary and, and they really do need each other. Um, you know, the small companies out there, I know developing the next application or the, the smart ones are definitely looking at fundamental research to find out, you know, what kind of fundamental features will enable their next application. Exactly. Or yeah. And, and, and yeah, academia and the fundamental research uh, areas are, it, it's good that I think they, they have to be more involved in commercial applications, you know, and not just sort of create in a box, if you will. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely complimentary. Very good. Um, okay, so next question. What specific uh, STEM, science, techn technology, engineering, and math disciplines, do you think would be good choices for young people entering college today? And I know this is right, right in your wheelhouse, so. Yes, and, and look, I don't have to tell you uh, that computer science continues to explode and uh, will do so for some time to come. Um, we look at cybersecurity as one of those jobs and it is known that actually even today there is like 2 million missing cybersecurity professionals around the world and you can look at cybersecurity or security being important both at the cyber level threats of all kinds to financial industry to our democracy as we have seen to also hardware um, you know secure chips for the little devices that you have in the in the hospitals that are being wheeled around um, but there are uh, many, many other uh, areas. I mean, communications are still hot, though it doesn't seem like uh, people, kids kind of see that. You know, I was mentioning 5G and then 6G. I mean, if we didn't have wireless today, how would we do this, what we're doing right now, right? And, and, and we as a country also have to be, in some sense, able to do things um, and, and to have Manuf some manufacturing and some, uh, you know, a level of expertise in this country. Um, there are other things that are very interesting that are capturing uh, sort of imagination of, of, of kids and, and, you know, even those who are going maybe to graduate study, like what people today called responsible AI, right? What does this mean? How do you use, how do you harness this technology in a way that is just. And what does this mean, right? The algorithm by, its, by itself is not biased. We as humans are biased and we create those algorithms and we use the data and the data sets that may not be complete and accurately representing whatever it is that we are trying to represent. You know, the health, uh, you know, doing any sort of technology that relates to health I mean, I don't even want to mention the pandemic, but it's clear, right? What would you do now if you didn't have the technology to enable and, and um, hasten and you know, improve access? You know, people are using now telemedicine more than ever, and this was not the case um, a year ago. So there is a number of things. Technology is clearly one of the most exciting areas and within that there is so much that you know it's kind of something for everyone 
environmental engineering is extremely exciting for people and figuring out how do we reverse the effects of climate change? How do we stop it or how do we reverse it? So, I mean, the students coming in today uh, to study are much more interested in doing something that they feel makes a difference in the world. I will be honest and say, when I went to, to, to college, all I wanted to do is to do math. I really didn't care sort of what kind of math. And so I went to electrical engineering, not because I knew what electrical engineering necessarily was, but because somebody told me there's a lot of math there. So if you want to do it, go there. I said, sure, fine. Why not, right? And then I discovered that there are lots of places in, in electrical engineering. I love signal processing. And in the end, I kind of found my path. Um, but today, I don't think that many kids choose it this way. They choose it more as sort of the impact and the effect of this technology on something else. So lots of them would come and, and, and they do the same thing when they go to companies. They require and they ask of these companies to do something that they believe is worthwhile for somebody larger than themselves. And that's a, that's a good development, right? It's a good development because that's a positive you know, positive push for the technology and the society. And we as engineers and technologists didn't always think that way. We were just entrenched in the excitement of the how, of figuring out the problem, not necessarily of the why always. I'm not saying that it's general, but definitely there is a kind of seismic shift that I see in the younger kids who are coming and also the the, the younger faculty who are coming coming today. Yeah, I um, I couldn't agree more, uh, and I think it is a great thing. Uh, and I was the same when I I went to college. I, I picked what interested me, um, what I thought I was good at, and but mostly what fascinated me. And 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 like you, I, I followed a path uh, as I learned more and and became more aware of what was possible within it. But I think it's a great shift for young people today that absolutely on, on the environment, climate change, you know, engineering of cities, uh, alternative yeah, that's fuels, very, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and, Urban so, anything, you know, think about making the cities livable, equitable, you know, uh, able to, you know, provide the environment for people with disabilities to live there and, and work and, uh, have appropriate transportation and you know our school is in Brooklyn so we are in the largest urban sort of lab in the world right New York City so this is super exciting when you see you know sort of fruits of your work that they actually have some positive impact on somebody's life that is that is a heady feeling it is. It's great. So just to sum up, it seems like uh, healthcare, cybersecurity, AI, and environmental and urban engineering would be great choices for any any young uh, person today. I mean, people do robotics. That's very popular. Um, yeah, there are, there are a number of them. Yeah, great. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. A few more questions, and then we'll we'll see what the audience has. Um, what can colleges and universities do today to, to better or further align with the technology and the startup community? Hmm, that's interesting. So I think that there are three lines along which there is a real potential and kind of an obvious one for alignment. One is along the line of education, of course, because we are the ones producing the talent that these companies will need once they graduate, right? But we don't want to produce this talent in a vacuum. While it's important for people to have a broad background and necessary you know, deep skills, it's also necessary for them to, to be aware of what's happening in the real world so that there is some sort of a transition between once you graduate with, with a degree and once you go to a company. It's always true that once you, let's say, go to a company, there is some period of time in which the company kind of trains you for the specific work in this company. But working with companies to 
you know, through internship programs or co-op programs or potentially companies funding, let's say, master's projects or capstone projects or something we call for us vertically integrated projects where kids work on, on projects for three, four years, potentially for credit. That's one area. The second one is, of course, along the lines of research. Now, you know, the university is not a company, meaning, you know, we will not have a capacity to mass produce a product. But the universities are places where the brain power is freely bubbling around, sort of like Bell Labs, and where you can go for expertise to see what's at the front lines. And, you know, the companies, you know, usually do this by being parts of our centers or maybe funding a PhD student or, a, you know, professor's group. They have access to the kind of latest and the greatest. And then they can take it and kind of scale it to, to a large degree. And the third one is along the lines of um, entrepreneurship, right? Because we are also trying to educate our students so that there are these unusual technologies, these engineers or technologies of the 21st century that are not only deep technically, but are also ethically bound, that they have the understanding of the implication of their work, but they also have an understanding of how they could potentially, you know, uh, start a company or promote their product. So like a, like a broader portfolio than what we used to be like you and I were educated, you know, not that it was bad education, it was just very different for the world of today. So I think there are lots of these axes along which academia and industry could and already does collaborate to create this seamless sort of pipeline of people who get educated and then enter the workforce and produce something really valuable. True, true. And yeah, lots of work with, I know NYU is doing work with incubators and accelerators, and I think that's, that's all great stuff. Um, great, thank you. Um, so can you talk a little then uh, as a follow-up on that uh, about what NYU is doing to foster entrepreneurship and growth for technology startups? I have to say that that was one of the things that surprised me uh, quite a bit when I came to NYU, how entrepreneurial it was and how entrepreneurial, I mean, my school, Tandon is. I mean, for example, we have these called Future Labs, they're incubators. And the first one was funded by the city in the sector such as digital data, urban like clean tech, and even one that focuses on a population on the veterans, uh, catering to military veterans and spouses. Then we have a whole set of student entrepreneurial activities. And we would like to think that um, Every student who goes through Tandon will have some sort of a experiential slash entrepreneurial uh, experience. It can be anywhere from research to being taking, for example, they can take internship for credit in our own future labs, in our own incubators, because they're right there on campus. So, you know, as a sophomore, they can take credit for a course, working with a small company on something. I wish I could have done this at the time. And then we have a number of other ways in which we foster and promote this in students. For example, we have one that was really came out of this pandemic um, in response to the lack of uh, PPEs and ventilators. We had groups of people actually led by our future labs and you know faculty and students who created an open source design i mean within days an open source design for very cheap face shield that then was downloaded two million times and produced seven hundred thousand of these for new york city and you know another one that became a company that was trying to address the lack of ventilators by taking the cpap and bipap machines and adopting them using a hairdressing hood into like a negative pressure personal space. I mean, it sounds crazy, but it happened in two weeks 
with people shipping things to each other because they couldn't work together in the same space. And out of that, our director of, of entrepreneurship and the manager of, of all our future labs, except for Tling Tech, came with the idea of creating what he called a tandem made challenge, where in three two week stints, students would um, work on a problem that was actually given to us by NYU Langone, the medical system, to address various issues related to pandemic. One of them was, let's say, touchless door handles and knobs and so on. But the challenge was to produce something that you could produce at scale, is cheap and fast to produce. And it would be, it doesn't completely, because the easiest thing would be to say, I'm gonna remove the handle, right? And put something else, you know, you can put RFID or something, who knows. Um, so we are, and then as this was a response to the challenge, we are now thinking, how are we going to embed this into our curriculum so that more students have access to it and then they will get um, they will get mentorship from our incubators on how to develop some of these ideas to actually potentially start companies. So there's a lot of excitement about figuring out how to how to actually do that. Yeah, that's great. And, and I love the um, the real world aspect uh, you describe. Uh, where students, you know, early in their in their uh, degree program are are forced to think about these real world, you know, not just a, a academia, but real world. How do you how do you apply all the great knowledge you're learning here to to either yes yeah, something as noble as 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 helping uh, with COVID. Uh, or something that, you know, is uh, how you sell a product in the marketplace, you know, uh, and so forth. But so, also do this, but also doing that, working on a team that's very broad, right? That's, that's not just electrical engineers or just mechanical engineers or just, it's a group of people and we even have integrated design and media. There are a group of people, sometimes they have students from our Stern Business School to help them with preparing a business plan. Sometimes they have students from our school of arts. So all these things to create this very heterogeneous group, sort of think of like Apollo 13 mindset of solving a problem, come together and figure out how to put, you know, put, what is it, a square peg into a round hole or the other way around, right? E either one will do in that analogy. Yeah, exactly, I yeah. get it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, I've been there. I mean, it's fantastic the way it's changed at the Brooklyn campus. And, and you know, you have the makerspace there, right? Oh, my God. The makerspace is, I took my husband, who's a computer scientist, but he's also a person who likes to work with his hands a lot. I took him there one day and he said, just leave me here and come back in four hours and pick me up because it's like a candy store, right? You go inside and you know, there is a vertical farm and there are kids building a concrete canoe and there are people printing a brace for kids with cerebral palsy. I mean, it's just, you go around and you get so excited by all this. And these are students, these are kids doing that, right? Yeah, yeah, F fascinating. Uh, and, and fascinating uh, to see them at such a young age get engaged at that level in, in modeling yeah. and 3D printing and, and as you say, problem solving, you know? Yeah. Great. All right, so we have one last question and then we'll see if we have any from the audience. Um, where do you think um, New York City area will be as a technology hub in uh, 10 or 20 years? And uh, we'll have that as kind of whatever your closing thoughts are. Well, look, I am a, a, a perennially optimistic person. So New York City is already a technology powerhouse and it wasn't maybe 20 years ago, right? Compared to Silicon Valley, you know, Brooklyn and New York City are, are, are developing at incredible rates. Now, of course, comes the pandemic and, and puts a break on many of these things uh, and, you know, puts a huge financial strain on the city and on the state and all of this in the in the short term i'm sure is are all of these things will impact us greatly 
But I sort of think that we have so much creative brain power in this city. Again, I've been here for 35 years almost. Um, you know, the city sort of comes out, you know, the, it, it always, even if there are hard times, it always attracts very, very bright and creative people to come back here and help innovate. And because there are going to be such great problems that need to be solved from urban to how do you bring back the culture and the theater world in, in the capital, you know, of, of entertainment in the world. How do you deal with climate change? You know, I, I live on an island. The rising seas are, you know, a problem. How do we deal with all this? So with all the educational institutions and technology sector and the fashion industry and financial industry and everybody else, it's going to be, I think it's going to be tough for a while, but again, it's going to pose challenges that will be in some sense exciting for us to solve. So again, I think that in 20 years, we will be the number one tech hub in the world if we are not already. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Just the, the dynamics, as you say, you know, of, uh, uh, of the city and uh, it's, it's been that way for a long time. And, and yeah, in the last 20 years, I'm every year I go in every month or so I go into the city and I just see the changes, you know, in Chelsea and I go down to Brooklyn and it's just such a good thing. And I, of course, forgot to mention, which is crazy of me, but, you know, biotech and, and health technology and anything related to health, right? That's, that's one of the big, uh, big parts where city is developing like crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So we have some questions from the audience here from you, for, for you. Um, let's see. The first one was, um, how is a large bureaucratic company able to be so innovative? Do you mean, uh, I, I'm Labs. assuming it's, it's Bell Labs. Well, but Bell Labs was really not a large bureaucratic company. It was a small portion. And you know, you can answer that one too, right? It was a small portion of a large bureaucratic company. And that small portion was given, I think, from what I know and from what I've experienced, a huge amount of independence and financial support to figure out what it would do. And part of it is that that, you know, that small portion was smart enough to connect itself with the business parts of the company and see what of those problems could be solved. And this is how the transistor came about and, you know, Shannon and information theory and, and many other things that may start seem like they were developed in a vacuum, but they were not, right? They were there because there was a company that was sitting sort of on top of it. Exactly. Yeah. And AT&T was definitely bureaucratic, but they were smart enough um, to let Bell Labs, you know, chart its own course. Exactly. And, exactly. And, and they were patient enough. And, and, and because they had the money, um, they had, uh, you know, they were patient enough uh, to say, OK, it, it doesn't have to happen this quarter or even this year. And it doesn't even have to have a well-defined application out there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's something that you know they, they would give you. And I, I even saw this when I worked in in Homedale in the '80s, you know, in the late '80s and '90s, um, where you know you, there wasn't that much pressure um, uh, to uh, to have immediate results. I mean, you had to work and you had to work very hard, but you worked in the manner that you described earlier. You worked because you love it. And, and so I think they were smart enough to see that uh, if, we, if we treat, you know, individuals in that way, we'll probably, it'll probably be a commercial success uh, at some point. So, uh, very good. Okay, the next question is, um, what exactly is the Bell Labs model? Is it based on organization or problem-centered or people-centered? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, I think it was probably organized around some strategic areas that someone came up with, and I don't actually know the history of how that happened, but then it just went after people. 
and then sort of let them find their own way within the organization. So, you know, you would be hired into some group, let's say, I don't know, physics, and then people would be naturally drawn to whatever, you know, either what they were already doing or something that somebody else was doing. I think the sense, it was a very um, academic place in some sense, at least when I was there, but without the teaching part, right? Uh, and without having to, without, okay, so without teaching, without students to work for you, though we could have students come and spend months with us or even, you know, or summers. And without having to really look for money. Um, now, whether this is sustainable, I don't know, but this is almost like saying, okay, I'm going to take a, a percentage of my whatever, gross or, or net, and I'm going to put this into unfettered research. How many companies are willing to do that? I don't know. That's why I was thinking, you know, making something like this a government lab where it's almost like an NSF lab where it's funded to do research along some lines, right? And NSF does this today, but different ways by encouraging big centers and institutes from the places that have the capacity to come together to solve a specific large problem. And this is typically universities sometimes with, you know, collaboration with companies. Yeah, and, and what I saw at least in, in Homedell was, uh, you know, it, it, there definitely was a rigid organization, very hierarchical, uh, you know, and there was a path every, you know, if you were a member of technical staff, you know, after two to four, you no, know, after maybe four to six years, you could become a, an MTS supervisor and then a director and, and there were set intervals there. But that's really not the essence of it. I think it, it, it's what you said, it's people centered and empowering individuals. You know, for example, you know, one of the things I remember was a fantastic technical library, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you could go down, uh, whether it was your break or not, you could just go down there and sit in the library in the atrium uh, of Homedell and, and read and nobody bothered you. It, it might be related to what you're doing. It might be unrelated, but um, so yeah, I think it was that element. Faith sorry, in that, people. Yeah. 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 That element of trust and, um, and, and uh, it, you know, go back to what you said earlier about the, the passion and what people, what makes people happy to do. So, mm -hmm. um, at the time, would someone be able to ask to work at Bell Labs or did people get invited? I was, I mean, you were hired like for any other job. So you would go to interview. Um, I mean, it was, it was essentially a company. So it was an interview at the company. The Bell Labs was, you know, it was part of a company. The same way you would go on an interview in any company today. That's how it worked. You would go give a talk, people would come to a talk, you know, ask you questions, um, and then you would be hired or not. <laughs> right, right. The only thing I saw was they definitely did have a preference for certain universities, uh, engineering schools. Mm. And uh, I, know, I know I got in there almost entirely on the strength of my NYU uh, degree so and my boss actually told me that a few months after he hired me he said that was the biggest thing he said we had a lot of good folks come from NYU so shout out to NYU that's so funny because uh there was a little bit of how shall I say maybe a little bit of snobbishness of of that you know like schools we used to joke because at some point in the math center there were three people from my high school a math high school in Belgrade so we used to say that there are more people from my math high school than some universities and they should put it on that list of yeah. sort of preferred places, right? <laughs> true, true. No, it's not like you couldn't get in. It, and I don't mean to say that you couldn't get in if you weren't on the list of universities, but they-, they That was a pipeline, you're right. There was a little bit of a pipeline from some groups into different yeah. groups, definitely. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so next question, how were mistakes or projects not being completed as hoped, handled by supervisors and management? 
Okay, that's a really tough one um, because I feel, at least again, I'm speaking just about the period that I spent there, that was the 90s, that we operated sort of like faculty. So independent contractors in some, in some sense. So you would pick your project and you would work on it and then show results, present at conferences and so on. Um, so it wasn't, again, it was an industry. It wasn't like there was a team of people working on the same, pro not that we sometimes didn't work with business units uh, on specific projects, but it was a very different, it was, it was really like, it was really like academia. You were mostly accountable to yourself. Um, not that, you know, the boss couldn't come and say, hey, you know, what are you doing? But as long as you were doing something that was recognized by your peers and you published and that was successful, that was fine. Right, and, and yeah, you know, I, I, they weren't shy about, you know, uh, at least where I worked in Homedale, they weren't, I, I know you were Murray Hill, but in Homedale, they weren't shy about, you know, uh, they gave you a long leash, but if, 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 for, uh, if there were individuals that weren't pulling their weight or there was a cr really critical deadline for a software release or something and it had to be done. I again, it goes back to if you feel like if you feel like you're being treated like a human being and, and, and you're in the in one of the best places to work. And I think this applies today. Um, I think you're going to put out more for the company and, and you're going to want to work late and you're going to meet the deadline. So uh, it wasn't like, you know, there, there had to be a lot of um, cracking of the whip, so to speak. Um, but it was also very, very much, I think, dependent on the area you were in, um, you know, whether it was research or, you know, it was a business unit, uh, the types of work that you were doing. Uh, some places were doing really projects that had deadlines and so on. I, I remember that there was like HDTV, but some people were more like, sort of like independent contractors, right? Absolutely. Sort of like faculty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good point. It really depended on the area you were working in. Mm -hmm. So a um, few more questions. Uh, did the innovations that emerged from Bell Labs provide a large financial return to AT&T from applications or did they just create lots of patents? Hmm, I don't know if you know the answer to this. I just remember at the time that they were telling us that there was lots of trading of patents with let's say companies like IBM so that Bell Labs would or you know AT&T would get communications patents and you know IBM would get computing patents but I don't know how much really direct benefit there was back to AT&T I don't know do you know the answer to this yeah, well, I, again, it depends on the discipline. So, so for example, with the Unix operating system, right? So, and the C language, you know, that was developed, I know, for an area I worked in, which was uh, digital switching and networks, high-speed mm -hmm. networks. And, um, and so uh, it, it was, it was the, the C language and the Unix operating system were developed to fulfill a need. Um, AT&T needed digital switches for telecom. And yeah, and Birmingham and Ritchie were there. They were basically, they were in Murray Hill, I think around the corner from me. So that was another exciting thing. Like I yeah. would walk down and, oh my God, look at these guys, right? Who just wrote the famous book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Which is great. You know, and actually somebody mentioned that in the comment that you could talk to Dennis Ritchie or, <laughs> you know, Kernahan. And, um, so you got to meet these people, but, um, no, the, uh, AT and so so then eventually you know um, uh, AT and T with Unix for example did the the Johnny Apple siege you know where they just started giving it away and you know eventually that that became you know uh, 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 the Berkeley version and then Linux as we know it today which is which is everywhere um, but they certainly made their money off it um, and and so it's. Probably with any, like with any patent portfolio, you know, a small percentage make a huge amount uh, of money. 
And I, in my experience, yeah, AT and T definitely made a lot of money. Uh, you know, but they, they, they served a great purpose too. I mean, nobody else could have done some of the work that we needed or needed, the world needed assistance with, let's say for radar in World War II. Yeah. You know? And nobody else had the wherewithal to get all those, those brilliant scientists together to develop something like the transistor um, or, or had the funds for, for laser uh, research and so on. So, um, so the question, see, that, that's an interesting thing since you're mentioning this. So is this fundamental research or is this applied research? I mean, one could argue both, right? Right. What right. if you didn't have the transistor? It's a very fundamental piece, right? That, you know, spurred the entire, the entire world, right? The entire electronics industry. But it was also a very applied piece of research that was trying to solve the problem. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And in its initial form, you know, it was big and bulky, and it cost a fortune. And 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 yeah. And there's a great example of 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 the real world and applications. They had no concept of how they would then mass produce that. And you know, that then took you know um, the original Bell Lab scientists going out to California and forming you know what became Silicon Valley or Fairchild Semiconductor and Intel and so forth. And but it eventually led to silicon, uh, silicon chips and uh, making transistors on them and uh, all of the all of the hardware for the computing technology that we have today. So, yeah, you don't know what that when you start down the path. But, you know, the so so to back to answer on that question, I think, yeah, probably like most patent portfolios, a small percentage made a huge profit for AT&T and a lot of them were just um, you know, byproducts, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let me just see. Uh, we've only got a couple more questions, I think. Um, were cost benefit analyses done on projects at Bell Labs? And if so, were they done on pioneering research? I, you know, I'm stumped on this one. I don't know if you have a, if you have an answer, maybe, you know, I was just, I, I mean, to me, I, I don't remember a lot of cost benefit. I remember being told, and by that I mean AT&T, in full recognition of the jewel that it had in Bell Labs, saying, look, we, we, have, a, we have a digital network, um, but it's prone to error. And uh, you know we need we need not just error correcting codes or, or error detecting codes, but we need error correcting codes. And uh, and if you do this for us, and you can you can make the algorithms actually fix the errors that are there, that'll have a massive uh, benefit, you know. On the, and and so that's on the benefit side, and you know on the cost side, it was like how much do you need, you know. <laughs> So they were in that, that very envious position, but uh, yeah, that was definitely, at least in my experience on the telecom and the software side, um, that, was, uh, that was done in the late eighties and the nineties, uh, to my knowledge. So um, let's see, some significant innovation occurs through interdisciplinary knowledge. How effective do you think academic culture is in stimulating the exchange of insights? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I mean, as an academic, my first impulse is to say great. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about where I'm sitting now um, and what's happening and what kind of research and work is being done and when i look at it almost none of it happens in isolation within just so like one group so that sort of this is one example and i sat in another school carnegie mellon that's equally collaborative and it's kind of part of its fabric of culture um i don't know that Every school is like that. Um, some are perhaps organized more like um, fiefdoms, right? Individual people with big groups who do work. 
I think some, some smaller schools and those that are kind of forced to do that, um, in the end benefit by making this part of the culture. So I think our culture right now is exactly that. I mean, not only within other groups in the department and the school, but across schools at NYU, which is actually a huge benefit to us because NYU has different 18 different schools and institutes, including a behemoth of the, of the medical school. And what's really interesting, and it, it just tells you how grassroots this all is. I mean, somebody sort of at the helm of the school can collect things and vision and strategize and so on. But in the end, there have to be people who are doing this. And when we looked at um, how many current collaborations, we just wanted to put it on paper to see where we are. With medical school, we found that we had almost a hundred, you know, half of them I didn't even know about. Um, so I think it's a, I think this is why people gravitate to academia, because you have this again, Bellabs like flat without borders sense of your research is just gonna take you where you need to go to solve whatever problem you're solving. And it's again, not within even the confines on your own university. So often people collaborate uh, across schools. Um, so I sort of think this as our model. It's, it's like a Bell Labs model or the tandem model where, where we are now. And we don't impose it. It just seems to naturally also, it's, it's like a positive feedback loop that naturally attracts people who like working in such a model and then they attract even more people. And so I, so it, it's almost like I think if I if I started an engineering school from scratch, I almost wouldn't have departments. I would just have this amorphous blob where people would kind of congregate and get together depending on what the current needs and interests are. And these things change. So for 10 years, it could be, I don't know, responsible AI and whoever has something to contribute to this would come together. But they would be also parts of other groups uh, you know, me with signal processing or machine learning expertise, I could be in the biotech group, but as you read before, I worked on civil engineering problems and smart infrastructure. So I would probably attach myself to these two different application domains and potentially sort of uh, fundamental, you know, AI algorithms and, and something like that. So I think, yes, uh, academia naturally does that because there is no power from the top that says this is exactly what you have to do. It's very much grassroots driven. Very good, very good. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and kind of related to that, there's another question here. Um, does, engineer, does the engineering curriculum uh, have too many required courses? So it's difficult <laughs> Sorry, go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm going to tell you why I'm laughing. So it's difficult for students to take courses in subjects like history, political science, philosophy, uh, religions of the world, and other important liberal arts courses. So this is very interesting because when I came to this school, I came from, from the department. I was department head of electrical and computer engineering at Carnegie Mellon that has this famous model of having very few required courses. And the rest are sort of depth and breadth and people kind of figure out what their path is going to be. I came to this school, which was rather rigid um, and had uh, a few electives and little space. And so this is something we worked on to kind of break this down because I think modern engineering needs to allow for this sense of figuring out what you want to do and kind of create your own path a little more than just somebody prescribing exactly what you need to take. But at the same time, to answer your question about history and political science and so on, this is very important and all our students have to take, you know, general education courses. So how to become good in writing to, you know, whatever they choose actually. So they get to choose courses like that. But we also want to imbue them with 
perhaps having requirements of taking ethics and understanding what, you know, this is of course very important in biomedical engineering, but perhaps other engineering disciplines didn't think very much about it, but it's an important uh, part of what we do to understand the impact of whatever it is that we do and we create. Um, having entrepreneurship courses, having perhaps finance and business courses that would allow people to come out uh, have being conversant or at least having the vocabulary to understand what happens when they go into the real world. So we're trying to kind of create these unconventional but holistic technologists and, and engineers. I mean, at, at least that's our aim. Yeah, and you know, my experience at NYU uh, for, for my graduate degree, I, I definitely, I agree with you, it was very rigid. There, was a, there were a lot of required courses. Um, but, you know, much as you, and, and I think everyone should be very well-rounded in history, political science, philosophy, and, and many of the other arts. Um, but, you know, when I got to Bell Labs, I found that that rigid grounding and in, in fundamentals um, you know, really served me well. And so I, I think it's nice to have all of, as you know, the, the liberal arts and the non-engineering or non-science related subjects, as long as you've got what you need to be an electrical engineer or a physicist and so forth. So, yep. you know. it's a It's a fine line and, you know, it's a kind of a dance of figuring out exactly what's needed. But Look, as an electrical engineer, when I went to school, it was considered that I absolutely needed to have electronics and EM and power. And I'm not sure that today's electrical engineer has to have each one of these. You can have a subset so that you are broad enough to understand, you know, sort of the hardware part, if you want, and the software part of the of the discipline, but you don't necessarily have to have it all, right? Allow flexibility and space for people to experiment and create sort of their own, their own experiences and their own degrees while having the broad background from which you can kind of spring into anything. And this is why I think those, uh, the, the engineers that were coming out of the DC department at Carnegie Mellon were highest paid in the country. Everybody wanted them. Because of that, exactly. There was this small number of required courses, very small, only seven. But then they got to go and, and you know, kind of experiment after that. I mean, experiment, they still had to satisfy, you know, there was like a breadth and a depth. And, you know, we are sort of going towards this uh, in this school as well. Attendant. Yeah, that, and that's a great point. I mean, you know, I think it was said that like at the time of Apollo, you know, there were a few key people that understood most of the working parts, but by the time the shuttle came around, no single individual, even the brightest minds, because, you know, and, and it's the same with uh, software and, and hardware. It's, you know, no, as you say, no one individual, you know, can, can get their head around everything. So, it's about specializing. And, and so maybe that does lead to, you know, a little more room for other disciplines and freedoms. But that's also because you can become, you know, I, I think you need to be deep in something, but you also have to be broad. You have to have a vertical and you have to have a horizontal, right? right. And how deep you are, you don't have to be deep in 17 subjects. You can be deep in three, right? And then have the breadth to understand enough so that if the problem would arise, you would be able to understand the sort of the overall goals and so on, and you could sit down and learn, right? You need to be able to also learn on your own because that's what we do all our lives, right? And when we encounter the problem, we, it, it's not like we are constantly using the knowledge that we already have. We have to go and learn a lot of stuff over and over and over again. Absolutely. Um, Great, two more questions. Um, keeping an eye on the time here too. Uh, Bell Labs require the support from the CEO and the board of directors with a 25 year vision. This tends not to be the case in the 21st century. How can we change this? Yeah, that's, that's a hard one. 
that's a hard one really i mean because look nobody can mandate this right on on a bunch of companies so it has to be visionary leaders within companies and ceos that would recognize that some longer term thinking is necessary um but also perhaps you know this was a different time that was the time that you had these companies where people would work for 50 years in a single company like at at and or ibm or any one of those you know i mean ibm is not the same ibm of of then but hewlett packard and you know gm or whatever um so it's harder perhaps today for people to say we are going to invest in something that's going to pay dividends in 30 years from now um but that's why perhaps these government i mean when i say government i mean government funded like you know nsf or nih labs and so on and nih has them right um where people can perhaps work on problems that have a longer horizon true and you know again in my experience at the labs um you know it's not so the two the two ceos that i recall from back then were uh ian ross and charles brown and from what i know of both of them um they were they were bell labs guys and i think that was important so they they graduated up through that hierarchy I mentioned earlier that rigid hierarchy, and uh, you know so so the CEO was not a transplant you know from another another tech company like you might have today, um, so he, he actually had a lot of allegiance. He spent his whole career at Bell Labs. He understood how the moving parts worked. He moved. He understood how AT and T worked and Western Electric and the other uh, the Bell operating companies worked. So I think when he got to the top, he had more of a sense of, um, I don't know, uh, of a connection with the organization. And I think that helped. And maybe that between that and, and having, the, having the faith in, in that organization, not just blind faith, but actually seeing the financial results of what came from it, um, maybe that made it easier for, you know, um, to get the board of directors to go along with them uh, on on things like that. There's nothing like success, right? Uh, you know, to 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 sway a board or an individual. Uh, as long as you're you're having commercial success, I think. Um, but but look, it it used to be that all of these big companies had labs that were like Bell Lab, right? There was the HP Lab, and you know, IBM Lab still exists. IBM Research, right? And and yeah. Bell Labs and and so on. Uh, today, I think it's different, and so it really depends on a CEO saying, you know, I do want to have something that's, you know, either completely unfettered or it's just, you know, allow people to dream, like what Google did when they split, right, and, and have Alphabet and, and Google. So they have something that's a money-making engine, and they have something where people can sort of vision and, and dream. Um, but how many of these can allow themselves to do that? I don't know. I mean, you have to have power, you have to have money and to, you know, persuade your board to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to spend some portion of what I do, uh, not return it maybe to investors, but put it into this that might not give me a uh, return in the next five years. Yeah, and, and I think a track record of success really it goes a long way there too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So last question, um, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but uh, uh, how did Bell Labs compare to Xerox Park? Oh, that's interesting. Well, I had friends um, at a time at Xerox Park at their lab. I thought that it was similar um, except that I thought that Xerox Park was more uh, focused in terms of what they were doing because um, Bell Labs had, you know, from fundamental physics and chemistry to communications. And I think Xerox Park was more focused because of the business of the company. 
Um, even though, yeah, you're right that Bell Labs, I mean, communications and switches and all switching, all of this was front and center because of the core business of AT&T. But I somehow had the impression that my friends were working on more focused areas. Whether this is true or not, I don't really know. That's what I remember from, the, from that time. Yeah, and I, I'm not that familiar with Xerox Park other than, you know, the, the, they developed the, uh, the graphical user interface and, and, and displays and many other great technologies. But from what little I know, they afforded their scientists like, like IBM and Hewlett Packard and the other companies you mentioned, it was all about, uh, you know, allowing those companies that same freedom um, and treating their employees, you know, um, in such a way that it, uh, it, it, it made them want to go to work and it made mm -hmm. them want to create and invent and so forth. Yeah. So very good. Okay. Well, um, this brings us to the, uh, the conclusion of our event for this evening. Uh, again, I want to say uh, really a hearty thank you, uh, Yelena, for uh, participating tonight and, and to you and the whole NYU team for being part of our event. And uh, I also want to thank the, um, the board and the team at MIT Enterprise Forum for the logistics and helping uh, make our event possible. And um, again, uh, if uh, anyone would like to sign up uh, for a membership, um, just uh, reach out to a member of the team, go to our website, uh, mitefnyc.org. And um, again, thanks, Yelena. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I had a lot of fun. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Dan, for allowing me to go back uh, down the memory lane and to everybody else for sharing this with us. You and I clearly had fun. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of them. <laughs> we did. Fun memories. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. Bye thank now. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody.